my name is Nick Caldwell. I'm going to do a talk uh, about leadership. Uh, and also, thanks to Developer Week, you guys backstage, for getting me set up and having me back here. This is the third year I've been at Developer Week. Um, my talk's about uh, igniting uh, leadership in an organization. One sec. Oh, hey, backstage, guys, my clicker is not working. Just when I thanked him. Come on. Ah, there we go. OK. Let's start that again. All right, my uh, talk is going to be about uh, leadership. It's one of my favorite topics, and I'm glad to be able to come to De Developer Week and share some uh, ideas with you. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Nick Caldwell, um, currently Chief Product Officer uh, at Looker. Uh, previous to that, I was VP of Engineering at Reddit. Before that, General Manager uh, at Microsoft running a, a product family called Power BI. Uh, and I've got some, some pretty good educational credentials if there's uh, any bears in the audience. Uh, nope, okay, not today. So uh, the challenge I want to talk to you guys about is how do you scale leadership? How do you develop new leaders? And this is something I'm passionate about because I've built a lot of teams uh, over the years and had to, to face this battle at every place I've gone. Um, last job I had, I was at Reddit, and the challenge was to scale the engineering team uh, by uh, about 3x. CEO asked me to triple the team size. We ended up quintupling the, the team size. And uh, about a year and a half into that exercise, uh, me and the CEO were sitting uh, in a coffee shop, and he was like, Nick, I remember uh, back when uh, things were, were small. It was, you know, like everyone felt a sense of responsibility. Everyone I could, uh, I could count on everyone to be a leader. Now that we've grown and we've got, you know, 100 plus engineers, it feels like we're solving problems by just hiring more people as opposed to getting folks to really step up and lead. Um, and I don't think he was wrong. I mean, I, I think as you scale, you get more specialization and focus. Uh, you get more, honestly, politics and, and boundaries. This, uh, what you see on uh, the screen here is a Microsoft org chart, which I think was very representative of my uh, experience at the company. And then overall, like, if there's more people, like, there's kind of a, a less of a sense of, of ownership for any one person on the team. So you really do see that you know, if the company is small, if it's 10 people, that means that 10 people will want to step up and lead. You get to 100 people, 10 people will want to step up and lead. And the question is, how do we scale leadership? How do we prevent that from happening? So that even at 100 people, we got 100 leaders. All right. So my hope today is, I've thought about this problem for a little bit. I've got three tools and techniques, ways that you can think about this problem that I hope you can take back to your companies and your organizations and get people to grow uh, into leaders. All right, you guys with me? All good? Okay, a lot of head nods. <laughs> guys in the front row are really en enthusiastic. All right, so first idea, this is probably the most important one of the day. Leadership is not management, okay? So I wanna quickly talk about why that is important. You know, if you think about uh, management, Management really is about like predictability. You're thinking about, hey, I gotta get like these tasks done by a certain date with a certain quality level. You know, if you're a good manager, a large part of your job is being predictable, producing uh, predictable outputs and building a team that's gonna do that in a, in a predictable fashion. Uh, if you think about leadership though, like fundamentally, leadership is about change. Like you bring a leader in if you want something different to happen. And they're going to lead not necessarily through, you know, reporting structure. They're going to lead through influence, through ideas, through vision. Like, that is a fundamental difference between management and leadership. There's a quote I found online to, 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 that kind of addresses this. Leadership is working with goals and vision. Management is working with objectives and timelines. Uh, that's kind of a pithy quote. I kind of like to tell stories, though. Makes the presentation a little bit more interesting. So this is the most interesting management versus leadership story I, I could find. Hopefully you guys have all heard of the Manhattan Project. Manhattan Project, uh, most clo closely guarded military secret of World War II. Uh, if you guys didn't know this, Manhattan Project brought together hundreds of thousands uh, of people in the goal of developing uh, the, the first atomic uh, bomb. Uh, and it was operated by two very, very different uh, personalities. One was, I would say, considered kind of a leader, uh, and the other was definitely much more uh, of a managerial figure. So who, who are those two folks? Uh, Robert Oppenheimer. Hopefully you guys have uh, heard of him. Robert Oppenheimer was considered the leader of the uh, Manhattan Project. And this is a really great, great quote. I hope that 
like on my deathbed, someone says something remotely close to this about me. He knew how to organize, cajole, humor, soothe feelings, how to lead powerfully without seeming to do so. He was an exemplar of dedication, Oof, a hero who never lost his humanness, disappointing him somehow carried with it a sense of wrongdoing. Good God, like that, that sounds amazing. Now, you have to realize Robert Oppenheimer is a scientist. He's like inspiring people. Someone had to figure out how to coordinate all those 100,000 uh, people across the uh, United States. That man was Leslie Groves. Leslie Groves was more of the manager for the uh, Manhattan Project. Let's see what history had to say about him. The biggest son of a bitch I've ever met in my life. <laughs> He had absolute confidence in his decisions. He was absolutely ruthless in how he approached a problem to get it done. I've often thought that if I were to have to do my part all over again, I would select Groves as a boss, all right? You guys sense that? Boss versus leadership. That's kind of a good story. Now, the other thing I want to leave you guys with is, is uh, the mathematics behind this, just why you shouldn't require leaders to be managers. Like positional leadership simply doesn't scale. As your organization gets bigger, you know, you can check this org chart out. The number of, uh, of, of manager skills uh, uh, logarithmically, the number of people skills linearly. So there are just more people around if you can get them to step up and lead. The other thing is whenever you draw an org chart, at least in my experience, the smart people are at the bottom and uh, you're, you're missing a lot of opportunity if you don't pay attention to them. Um, the other thing is uh, it turns out people uh, uh, to scale leadership, Employees want opportunities more often than they want uh, positions. So this is a, a 2009 McKinsey study where they surveyed employees about uh, various incentive programs, you know, money, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll see here that opportunities to lead are actually more requested than like an actual pay raise, which is a little bit crazy to me, but it's true. There's the statistics. So. The question is, how do you give people opportunities? So this is the first tool that I want to give uh, you guys. I call it leadership breadcrumbs. And the technique is, is pretty simple. Uh, instead of in your next team meeting, like sitting there doing like your typical sprint update and just giving round robin updates, you can use this tool. Drop a few leadership breadcrumbs. Uh, step one, uh, provide visibility. So this is the most harrowing part of this. You've got to be able to open up to your team. You as managers or leaders, you actually have a really great insight into all the different problems and opportunities to lead in your organization. Like I bet any one of you, if I just said, hey, like what are the top five problems you're dealing with right now? Think of those as all five, of, all of those things, opportunities for someone to step up. You've got it all in your head right now. You've got to get comfortable talking about that, putting visibility on it uh, at your next uh, team meeting. So talk about it. Next, gets a little even scarier, invite discussion. So as a leader, this means you have to kind of be a little bit vulnerable. Talk about the problems that you're, you're uh, facing and maybe see if folks have some thoughts on how you might address them. And this is when you start to see sparks develop. Maybe someone will raise their hand and say, oh, I've got an idea. You have to do this and repeat. Probably about the third or fourth time you do it, someone will raise their hand and not just say, I have an idea, but I've actually like to put some more time into it. Or I don't just want to put more time into it, I've actually talked to two other people about this idea and we've come up with a plan. And at the end of that, maybe they actually will go and try and implement it or they'll ask you for permission to go and try and implement it. And at that point, you want to reward that person. Try and sponsor their idea if it makes sense, if it's the right thing to delegate uh, to them. You probably don't want to take every single idea, but you do want to reward the behavior of people participating in leadership. That's the key thing. And you can do that in a public fashion. So that's the first one, leadership breadcrumbs. Second uh, idea I want to get to you guys. This is the idea that anyone can be a leader, all right? There's whole industries dedicated uh, to the idea that you have to develop certain traits, being a good speaker or being charismatic or all these different things in order to be a leader. $24 billion is spent on leadership training every year in pursuit of this idea. And uh, I suspect everyone in this room is guilty of this, participating in this to some extent. Uh, you know, on the left here, we've got <laughs> probably, I think I have most of these books on my shelf at home, about 20 bucks each. Then there's conferences, Dale Carnegie, teach yourself to be a better speaker, more confident, all sorts of classes, seminars you can take for about 2,000 bucks. If you up it a little bit, you can hang out for $10,000 
with Irvin Magic Johnson, Suze Orman, Tony Robbins, Sylvester Stallone, and Pitbull. So that thing on the right is actually, that's not a Pitbull concert. That is a Pitbull leadership seminar. Pitbull will teach you how to lead for $10,000. Now, if you want to like really up your game, $100,000, and see if you can spot the Easter egg in this slide. For $100,000, you can get yourself an MBA. You're a credentialed leader now, so congratulations. Now, I kind of, <laughs> I, I, if you guys are sensing that I'm a little skeptical of this, yes, I am. Uh, there was a great study a few years back called Project Oxygen, and uh, they surveyed uh, uh, multiple leaders in different re research reports about what the top leadership traits were. Uh, to, to be a leader, you must exhibit these five things. Vision, empathy, empowerment, charisma, and expertise. Now, let's put that to the test. Let's think about current technology leaders and whether or not they actually meet this bar of leadership excellence. You guys ready? You want to do that with me? Let's do it. All right. First one, Steve Jobs. Definitely a visionary, definitely charismatic, but maybe not so empowering. This is a, a diagram of the Apple org chart. And you can see that all the lines point directly to Steve Jobs. OK? Well, let's keep going. This is actually not a, a, a military officer. This is uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, known to be empowering. So if you ever read how Amazon operates, the pizza-sized teams, they really do uh, a, a lot culturally to empower people to, uh, to execute in small teams. I think that that is a hallmark of their, uh, of their culture. But perhaps lacking empathy. Let's see, Amazon warehouse workers skip bathroom breaks to keep their jobs, says report. And if you check the news, you'll see something like this come out of Amazon like every month. It's pretty funny. Elon Musk, definite expertise. Uh, this is basically Tony Stark made real. Guy is launching space rockets. He's, t you know, anyway, guy is a genius, but maybe he's uh, burning out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Can't make that one up. And then finally, Mark Zuckerberg, definitely a, a visionary, definitely highly uh, expert, but you got to say, like, charisma, charisma, no. There are, in fact, entire internet forums dedicated to determining whether or not this man is a robot. <laughs> So the question is, like, leadership potential. Like, how are you supposed to know? How do you know this nerd lawyer or the stoner with the unfortunate hat is going to turn out to be both Nobel Prize winners, Gandhi and Barack Obama? Uh, I think what you got to do is, instead of traits, like, put that aside and look for passion. And uh, there's some evidence to support that for, for those of you who are mathematically minded. Um, in 1992, there was a study by Kreifel and Patler. They had uh, 1,500 people participate. They asked them, choose a career. Would you, do, would you choose your career for passion or would you choose it for money? And this is a longitudinal study. So 20 years later, they went back to those people. There are 101 millionaires. 100 of the millionaires chose passion and only one chose money. So this is a pretty good study, Kreifel and Patler. So the question is, like, all right, how do you kind of evoke passion, like everyone's passionate about something. Like how do you actually, what tool can you use uh, in your organization? So I'm going to give you guys this tool, it's called uh, Blue Flame uh, One-on-Ones. And the idea behind the Blue Flame is that you have perfect alignment between the needs of the organization and the passion uh, for, of the individual. So how do you get that? So next one-on-one. -on -one. Don't literally fill out this chart, by the way. This is all conceptual. I hope you all get that. Don't, don't sit in front of your reports with a Venn diagram. Anyway, you want to identify intrinsic motivators, which tend to be what people are really passionate about, and extrinsic motivators, uh, which are uh, things that the business needs. So intrinsic, what would you do if no one was telling you what to do? Look around your team. What problems do you think should be fixed? What would you want to spend your time on? And just fundamentally, what do you want to learn? And then extrinsic motivators. What are the major problems faced by the organization? What, does your, what problems does your manager bring up in a one-on-one? -on -one? Are there industry trends or technologies that we should be aware of? The intersection of those two things will align intrinsic uh, and intrinsic motivators and hit you right in the blue flame sweet spot. Now, there's an advanced version of this where you add one other element, which is team member feedback. And the reason this is important is because a lot of times you don't really know what you're good at. <laughs> like, you may have an idea of what you're good at, uh, but 
why don't you ask your team members what they think you're good at, and it gives you kind of a better understanding uh, of, uh, of your own capabilities. So intersect feedback, intrinsic, and extrinsic motivators. All right. Number, one sec. Now, third thing. If you've got passion and you've got opportunity, uh, that's actually still not enough. You still need uh, to have what I call the leadership moment. Um, what I mean by that is, even if you've got passion and opportunity, like for various reasons, people still do not uh, step up and lead. And the question is why? Um, this is a survey by the American Management uh, Association International. The summary of this is the reason people don't step up to lead is because the first rule of leadership is everything is your fault. Fear of being held responsible for failure uh, out of all other things that stop people from uh, 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 stepping up to lead is the number one uh, concern. So how do you like, combat this, all right? People still somehow manage to step up and lead despite this, all right? Is it, is it training? You know, is it putting pressure on people? Is it mentoring them, like having Pitbull come and do the, the all hands? I think that everyone has in their career like a moment where they decided to step up and lead. I remember mine was, uh, I was so frustrated with uh, the direction that our PM team was heading at one point that I was complaining to my mentor, you know, just stomping my feet. And he said, Nick, leaders take responsibility for what happens next. And I translated all of that frustration and energy into taking charge of what was going to happen with our product roadmap. So I think there's got to be something here where we either create a culture or something that eliminates fear of stepping up. So what can we do? Well, um, you guys probably remember Facebook used to have this kind of move fast and break things. I think that's a pretty good first step toward generating the culture. But let me give you something that's maybe a little uh, more reproducible, and it's maybe the OG version of this if you've never seen it. This is the original Nordstrom employee handbook uh, it is absolutely one of my favorite tools. Every time I set up a, a team, I basically show them some version of this. Let me just read it real quick. Welcome to Nordstrom. We're glad to have you with our company. Our number one goal is to provide outstanding customer service, set both your personal and professional goals high. We have great confidence in your ability to achieve them. Nordstrom rules. Rule number one, use your good judgment in all situations. There will be no additional rules. That is the most badass thing you can give to someone who you want to step up into a leadership position. All right, so take that home. Now, how do you now more formalize this? How do you, what's the next level toward encouraging uh, the culture? So I'll give you one more tool, and it's, uh, it's called sponsoring instead of mentor mentoring. I think sponsoring is a tool that you can use to overcome the fear of stepping up into a leadership. So if you guys don't know the difference between mentoring and sponsorship, Mentoring is like, you know, you go meet someone once a month and uh, you give them your problems and they like give you free coffee, okay? They're giving you ad advice, all right? Sponsoring amps this up a little bit. Sponsors, you, sponsoring, you go to someone, tell them your ambitions and so forth and so on, and they give you opportunities, all right? So what you guys want to become as managers uh, is sponsors of good ideas within your organization. So where can we find chances to sponsor good ideas? Usually that every company has some version of this. Uh, by default, you can use spare time, all right? Turns out if someone's really passionate about something, they will step up and kind of use their own spare time. I don't like to start with that, but it is, uh, uh, you know, the, the starting point. Hack days, setting some time uh, aside in your organization once or twice a quarter to, for, to let people work on ideas. You stepping in and saying, that's a good idea. I would love for you to spend your hack day on this because I think it will, uh, in the long run, contribute to the business. You can do that. And then beyond hack days, like you as managers have control over how the people uh, who work for you spend their time. So you may just occasionally need to step in and say, look, that's a good idea. Rather than you working on feature X, Y, and Z, I want you to take your idea and, uh, and have a few days on it. But you have control over that. And if the idea works, the best thing that you can do as a manager is to give away the credit. <laughs> Sponsor it, and the person who stepped up to lead, make sure that they take all of the credit for it. All right? Okay. So, these are the three techniques. What happens when you put all of them together? Well, to make a fire, you've got oxygen, fuel, and a spark. And I think to make leader, you need uh, opportunity, passion, and permission, 
right? And that's what we've talked about here today. So let's talk about results. How does this all turn out? So these techniques uh, I've used uh, at Reddit and other places uh, for some time. Uh, at Reddit, uh, you know, I saw a couple uh, really good uh, results. First on technical contributions, all from the bottoms up, just from people wanting to put in their own time and energy. Uh, we got uh, continuous integration, con continuous deployment, uh, performance testing. We uh, got Kubernetes microservices brought into our organization, which uh, contributed to cost effectiveness cost effectiveness of our operations. And then this one was really tough, GraphQL API support. We actually had an engineer so passionate about GraphQL that they came in and redid all of our API layers using GraphQL. This eventually became a fully sponsored project. You can imagine that's a tough one. And then maybe even closer to my heart, some of the people contributions. All right, An employee mentoring program was spun up uh, at Reddit. Uh, came from the ground up, a guy who was really passionate about mentoring. We've also used this technique at Looker. So Looker, the uh, employee mentoring program, started in this exact same way. Uh, deep learning and TensorFlow. A guy came in and was like, hey, I'm really passionate about TensorFlow. I'd like to have an opportunity to teach the rest of the team about it. We, I sponsored him with a little bit of uh, money for Tensor, TensorFlow credits. And about, uh, I would say, two months later, We've got multiple people on the team working in TensorFlow and actually contributing uh, to the overall business metrics. And then the final one, Reddit for Good, uh, this is simply um, con contributions to nonprofits. So people wanted to do more than just contribute technically or, or to mentoring. They saw ways to contribute to the local community. And this all came from bottoms up uh, uh, techniques. All right. So with that, I want to leave you guys with a final thought. Uh, you're all uh, managers, and I, I think that, in my personal opinion, management is one of the most important uh, roles in any organization. Not because you're responsible for shipping stuff on time. I know that you know, that's important. But I think, ultimately, the reason management is important is because you care about people and developing them and their wants and needs. Now, the thing I hope you all believe, you know, as a result of, uh, of this talk, is that everyone has the potential inside of them uh, to become a leader. That can happen through development, that can happen through like tapping into their passion, it can happen in lots of different ways. But you as managers are responsible for putting some of your time and energy into figuring that out for every single person. So the final lesson I want to leave you with, uh, hopefully you'll take these tools and apply them, but remember that leaders make new leaders. Thank you.